Hi, I'm Karin Kotsa and this day I would like you to take you back to the beginning of everything, where everything started in the Garden of Eden, where God came down in the late afternoon to speak to Adam and Eve, to tabernacle with them, to dwell with them, to be with them, to build relationship with them, to hear what they have been doing at that day. And that's where everything started, the love story between God and his creation. God and Adam and Eve, but then something terrible happened. We know the story. They were put out of the garden, forever excluded from the company and the presence of God, never to be able to walk with him again in the twilight or in the late afternoon in the garden. And that's, that's where the whole story starts. That's where God yearns till up to this moment where you are listening to me to tabernacle with you, to dwell with you. Now the story goes forward and they are the Israelites are in, in Egypt in slavery for 400 years. And then God takes them out of slavery into the, into the desert. And there he has a plan. He has a plan to come back into the presence of his people. He wants to dwell with them. So on the Mount of Sinai, he gives Moses two things. He gives, them, he gives him the Ten Commandments as we know. But he also gives them in Exodus. You can read about it in Exodus 25. He gave him the pattern of the tabernacle. And if you read in Hebrews 8 and 9, you will see that it is a shadow of heavenly things on earth. Of the heavenly tabernacle, a shadow on earth. And it's all for you and for me to be able to get into his presence. The tabernacle, of course, is for the Israelites to get back into his presence. But that they can only do once a year with a high priest that can go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement with preparations and bells on his robes and a, and, and a rope tied around his feet. So if he should horror of horrors, fall dead in the presence of God, they can pull him out because they cannot go in there unless they are fully prepared. So that is a pattern for the, the, the people of God to get into his presence. But there's also so much more to the tabernacle. It is an absolute foreshadow of Jesus, of the coming of Jesus, of the plan of God to redeem his people, to redeem you and to redeem me and to restore our relationship. The second thing, the third thing that it also does, you can also judge your walk with God. That journey that you are, like Paul said, it's a journey, it's a race that we run. You can judge where you are in that race according to the position of where you are in the tabernacle, which I will explain a little bit later. It is a wonderful way as well as a pattern for prayer a pattern of how to prepare yourself to position yourself to get into the presence of God. And that is what we do most of the time. Um, I, I just explain everything about the tabernacle and then we set up the tabernacle and you can go literally into the tabernacle, but you can do it behind closed doors in your prayer room. You can do that. So, tabernacle, built in the center of the, of the camp, two to three million Israelites camping around the tabernacle. Tabernacle, very small in comparison to the camp. But there's also a very crucial lesson about that. It says that God needs to be the center of your life. That is just, that is just how it should be. And then there was this cloud of his presence a symbol of his presence, him, himself, as a cloud on the tabernacle. And then by night, of course, you know it's the fire. And Moses will not move unless that cloud moves or that fire moves. And is that not what we are supposed to do in our lives? When God says, go, go, if he stays, stay. But we sometimes follow our own desires and what we think is the right thing for us. Or we just barge into some situation and then, oh God, please change this or this. But he never told us to move or he told us to move and we stayed. So that's also a very crucial lesson for us today, applicable to us in this day and age. But it was such a reality for the Israelites. 4,000 years ago, God gave Moses the pattern of the tabernacle on the Mount of Sinai. 
2,000 years on, in the future, Jesus will fulfill the tabernacle because the tabernacle is a foreshadow of what Jesus would one day do and be for us. And 2,000 years on, you and I are sitting here talking about what God did to restore the relationship. So if you see that small tabernacle in the center of the camp of two to three million Israelites, I said already, you realize that God needs to be the center of your life. And he was the center of the camp and of the people, his chosen people. The tabernacle consists of three distinct places, the outside court, the inner court, and the most holy of holies. Now, the tabernacle had a curtain, a hedge around it that separated it from the camp. And that is so symbolic sometimes of um, where we started. We started as slaves in Egypt when we were not saved. We were in slavery. We did not know freedom. We had to work to earn our right and our existence and um, to earn our food and everything. But suddenly, from the outside, you see a, you see a cloud and you see fire, so you know there's something else, but you can't see from the outside, you can't see inwards. Because this hedge, this protection, this separation is a little bit higher than a man. So you cannot see inside. And that's what the Bible says. What we believe will seem like foolishness to the world because they will not be able to see what is happening inside. And if you notice, there's only one door. There is only one way to get into the outer court of the tabernacle. Because there is only one way to get into the presence of God. Jesus. Jesus is the door. He is the way. There is no way that there can be more doors to get into the presence of God but through Jesus. The door was covered. It was closed. You had to go through. You had to go through this obstacle. You have to make a decision. You cannot just fall, in, fall into the tabernacle. You have to go through a separation. And that curtain was beautifully embroidered in white, the white linen, the righteousness of God and the purity of Jesus. The red, the symbolic value of his blood, the purple, his royalty and the blue, his divinity. Everything everything in the tabernacle. I am not even touching the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more. It is so deep. Everything is symbolic in God's kingdom. There is nothing random in God's kingdom. Would you, do you think that when God met Moses on the Mount of Sinai to give him, together with the law, the pattern of the tabernacle, that it will be just some, some random thing? Everything has got symbolic value and everything has a reason in God's kingdom. So you go through, you make a decision that you will follow Jesus Christ into the tabernacle, into the presence of God. That's where you get saved. That's you where you get from the outside, from the world, make a decision to go in through Jesus into his presence. That's the first thing you do. The first the first thing that you are confronted with is the altar. Now there, the priests had to keep that burning 24-7. They sacrificed goats, bulls, doves. The blood had to flow. There is no forgiveness. There is no life without the flowing of blood. And that we read in Leviticus. So that was something that the priests had to do. They had to bring... The Israelites had to bring in their sacrifices to try and pay for their sins. And none of that could really ever forgive them their sins. Now, is that not so beautifully symbolic of the cross of Jesus Christ? The one sacrifice, the innocent for the guilty, the one sacrifice that paid for all our sins, never again, do you have to slaughter an animal, do something to earn, or be someone else to get into the kingdom of God? Now, this is your first step. You do not have to be saved every time. 
you have to recognize the blood flowed for your sin and that price that was paid for your sin. And it was a once and all, once for all, never to be repeated, never needed again. And that's the first thing that we as new Christians get confronted with. Now, there is so much about the cross. You come from the old Adam to the new Adam, from the darkness to the light, from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sickness to health, from poor to being rich in Christ. And if we can really recognize what that did and does for us, we get our identity at the foot of the cross. And then we move a little bit forward. We're still in the outside. We're still in the outside camp. We're still busy with, with, busy with the body. We are still busy with the body, that which we need to get into place to, be, to enter even deeper into his presence. We are confronted with the wash basin. Now, the wash basin is really very interesting. The wash basin was made with the mirrors of the Israelite women. And the water is symbolic of the word of God. We need to wash ourselves clean with the word of God. We need to build our lives according to the plumb line that's, that God has said in his word. His word is alive. The water that flows from the throne room of God washes, our, washes us clean. We need to do that daily. We need to wash daily if you don't wash yourself, your body daily. You start smelling. And I'm afraid that you will start smelling spiritually if you don't wash yourselves with the word of God. The high priest, the priests had to wash themselves every time that they passed that lay there. Their hands and their feet. Now we don't put our hands, they don't put our hand, their hands in the water. It flows out. It washes them from inside out. And that's what the word does. We have to take it in to wash ourselves. We cannot touch the word to, to dirty it in any way. What we must really be careful of is changing it to suit ourselves. That is true. But what we must do is we must judge ourselves according to that word, to what the word says, and it has to wash us clean. Our emotions, our attitude. And just to go back to the cross, there Paul says, I die daily. And that is what we need to do as well. We need to forgive. If we have to forgive, we need to forgive. There's no ways around it. So many people in church stay there at the foot of the cross. They are just so happy to be saved. And they're so happy about the cross, but they do not live in what the cross means. And they do not change their identity. You really have to be, since I said in the beginning that this is a pattern of prayer, if you go into your room where you pray, you are confronted every single day by the cross. And every single day, you lay down yourself, you sacrifice yourself, your desires, your motives, what goes on in your heart, your bitterness, your envy, your jealousy, your unforgiveness. You have to lay that down at, this, at the cross. There's no way to get around that because Jesus said, I will not forgive you if you do not forgive. So we are at the lather now. We are at the wash basin. Where we are clean, we are justified by the cross. But when we go a little bit further and we wash ourselves in the word of God, we get sanctified. Of all the dirt that the world puts upon us, the sin that we make, we change our lives. And that is crucial. And so many people are not prepared to do that. That is why I say you can judge your spiritual walk according to where you are in the tabernacle. Let's look at what goes on in the inner court and the most holy of holies. Look at it first from the outside. You get the one layer that's on top of the holy of holies and the inner court and that's from goat skin. Now underneath the badger skin you will get the ram skin and the ram skin is dyed red. I don't really have to even go into that. That is so symbolic of the blood of Jesus covering everything that we are. That that did everything for us. And then you would get the goat skin. Remember the goat that they would lay their hands on to transfer all the sins of the people onto that goat and just chase that goat out of the camp to carry the sins out of the camp? 
It's symbolic of Jesus who carried all our sins. Crucified outside Jerusalem, outside the camp to carry all your sins. And lastly, the inside layer is beautifully, beautifully embroidered. It's a linen with all the colors that we spoke about when we, when we spoke about the entrance, the white, the blue, the purple, and the red. And there is so much more to discuss, but this is all we have time for now. Just remember that you are justified and you will sanctify yourself by doing your bit. Jesus did his but you need to go forward and wash yourself with the word of God so that you can be clean on the inside with your emotions and your thoughts and to remember also who you are in Christ. Next time we will go into the inner court and we will see how this is actually your mind and your will and your emotions, how that needs to be renewed and how God helps you with that and how he's given Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So that is all we have for today. I hope that this really made you just tingle with the possibilities of what you can do and how amazing God has set this up for you to restore your relationship with him. This is the biggest, the greatest love story ever told. He woos you to get you back into that relationship that we had with him in the Garden of Eden. So get yourself ready. Next time we will go inside, we will go a little bit closer to his presence, to where life is and the possibilities are endless. Have a wonderful day. Think about this, ponder this. Go read Exodus 25 to 30. Read Hebrews 8 and 9 and see how it flows into each other. Goodbye.